the movie preview critic, informing and entertaining your movie world. What's up, good movie lovers? Welcome to a movie review for Alice in Wonderland. This is the movie preview critic, joined by a good friend of mine. This will be a first video where um, it's not just me talking, it's uh, another well-educated movie aficionado, Jonas. Welcome, Jonas. Oh, thanks. Good to be here. So we checked out uh, Alice in Wonderland just a couple hours ago. Yeah, on the IMAX 3D. We've got some strong feelings about it, and uh, we're going to talk. So before that, I'll just quickly point out, as usual with the movie reviews, we always kind of just talk about the movies and mention spoilers and things because, I guess, what's the point of reviewing it if we can't talk about it? So if you haven't seen this yet and you're planning on checking out Alice in Wonderland, please stop this right now. Go no further. We don't want to ruin your good time. Okay, so Alice dies. <laughs> I didn't see that coming at all. He gets beheaded. Beheaded. And then violated by the Mad Hatter. <laughs> and the March Hare was watching. It was really disturbing. I can't believe Burton went there. <laughs> he is the Mad Hatter. That's true. I mean, yeah. You gotta stay strong. You gotta stay with the character. Yeah, right? we can't claim that in, in defense, I guess. <laughs> now, that would have been a movie. That would have been exciting. Uh, uh, unfortunately, the that. real movie was not that exciting. So, maybe, I guess we'll just do a kind of a quick, what's the story about? I mean, I think everyone knows what the... Well, I, th I thought it was a... What I was the one thing I did like is that it wasn't just retelling the same story we've seen from Disney already, you right. know, in the cartoon. It was if you've not seen it yet, it's basically just it takes place years later, about ten years later after her first visit when she's like nineteen. Yeah. So the Disney cartoon that we all know and love is her. That, that did happen. That did happen. It's the backstory. This is the live action sequel to right. the animated. Original. Kind of like Return to Oz. Yes. So this is, yeah, the Return to Oz. <laughs> <laughs> Very but nice without the it. motorcycle harpies. Okay. So we have Tim Burton behind the camera and his vision in infusing and infecting and informing infecting Alice might be, it, no, To be fair, I can't imagine another director doing it, though. Yeah. Can you? I can't think of who else would do... You think Alice in Wonderland? Like, yeah. oh, yeah, Tim Burton. Yeah, it totally makes sense. He seems to be made... To just have that car, he he knows how to bring cartoonism to reality. Yeah, he does. He's got his kind of this gothic sensibility that mm -hmm. kind of. Uh, my main complaint going in was like Tim Burton just seems to do Tim Burton movies. Yeah, it's kind of like he, he's kind of a hired gun. Like you bring right. him for that's for Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, or you know for this and just so, or you know what was the one with uh, Helen Bonham Connor, the musical Barbara Seville. Mm -hmm. Like my, I would say something about Tim Burton just as a director on a whole. I think he could stand to. Expand more, like yeah. Ed Wood, which, which was, was a departure. Ed Wood was phenomenal. Yeah. I loved Ed Wood. So is Tim Burton kind of in this? Let's say a few years back, M Night Shyamalan was caught in it. Uh, Kevin Smith, you know, you kind of get recognized for a certain style where it's like this is what got me popular. If anyone's going to come to see a Tim Burton movie, I have to do the Tim Burton thing. You know, it has to be colorful and just technicolor and over the top in terms of the visuals. I kind of, you know, I kind of think he has fallen into that and. I, w I went back and went Beetlejuice was so great. Yes. And Beetlejuice was such a hilarious movie and so well done. Such a new thing, like, n you've never seen before. Right. The original Batman. His yeah. version of Gotham City was fun. You know, I, even Batman Returns to some extent. There was <laughs> kind of a little a little callback to Batman in this. I think th th they did the moon where the cat, like, the, the moon turns into the cat face. And it was almost like that, like... When the bat signal went yeah. up and the moon became the bat. Maybe him kind of, like, doing a little bit of a callback to I that. I thought it was, like, the DreamWorks logo. Okay, that's but it was a Disney yeah, film, so same thing. probably, so, wasn't, unless he's <laughs> probably like, hey, not what he was going hey, for. Hey, DreamWorks, this is yeah. you know F my you. calling card. <laughs> <laughs> F you. Either I want to work for you or F you, whichever right. one. Is Tim Burton because you mentioned some great movies, Batman and Beetlejuice, right. which were really story driven, good characters. And Ed Wood, in there. which Ed is Wood. all story driven, all characters, yes. and all that. You know. And it has Johnny Depp in it, so there's no excuses here that if the same people who made that great character driven movie. If they're together again, why can't they do it more with this? Do you right. how, how do you feel about just the characters in this movie? With I just think that the characters were not well developed. They're all cartoons, and maybe that's a, a not really a complaint because it is based on a cartoon. The characters are all loony and you know all larger than life to a certain extent. Yeah, but like Alice, I thought was I liked what they did with Alice, where it's kind of this. Victorian girl, and she's got her own mind, and she speaks her own mind, and the whole thing is about her kind of coming to grips with 
herself and trying to be an independent person in a world that doesn't want her to be an independent person. Right. And I guess that's what the whole Wonderland thing is about, is thinking outside the box and being completely loony and mad. Yeah. And you know what? I'm so glad that you brought that up because it starts out that way, right? Where we introduce Alice. She's in the Victorian-minded kind of world where basically it was kind of a little absurd, though. It was like <laughs> no one no one has any creativity where it's like, okay, uh, what are you staring at the birds for, Alice? I was just thinking about what what it would feel like if I was flying. That's such a weird thing to think. <laughs> it's like every time she turns, she's like, I was just thinking about if the rose, if I painted the roses red. And that's a very strange, girl. Like, no one in that world... Has any imagination yeah. whatsoever. And I, I don't know if that's accurate or if it was just kind of a little bit over the top, just you know, to Burton just kind of having a little fun with that mentality. Mm. Just, you know, does Burton see Alice as himself when he was kind of younger and just kind of... You know, this... Uh, Everyone's telling you can't do this, you can't do that, yeah. and yeah. And you've got the weird hair, and you're this kind of, you know, right. eccentric kind of artist kid, and look at you making these little movies. I'm sure there's a l- I think well, all Burton's films are kind of about outsiders, to a certain extent. Yeah. I mean, definitely, you know, Beetlejuice, they're, they're newly dead, and yeah. that whole world, the fight with the living... And Edward Scissorhands. Ed, yeah, Scissorhands, the ultimate outsider. Ed Wood was an ultimate outsider. Even Batman, which is not his character, sure. is... So I think that's I think that's his common theme in Tim Burton movies is the individual uh, versus kind of the norms, right? Okay. Versus the normies. And this is absolutely rich for that with uh, Alice in Wonderland, and they're taking it to kind of this new level where okay, in the original she's the kid, so right. now you're entering adulthood, and this starts out with her basically being the cliche kind of I'm being forced to marry a guy who. I totally don't love, and I don't know him, and I want to be my independent woman kind of before. Right. It was cool to be an independent woman. So now she's going to go on this journey of self-discovery in this kind of fantasy land. That's absolutely Burton's territory. Now, I guess the question is, when she enters Wonderland, does the film succeed in kind of taking her through that kind of a journey of being tested and learning things about herself and, and I don't think to? I don't, I, don't, I don't think it did. I, don't, I think it was kind of any... Self-discovery she had was really kind of just ham-fisted and not believable. I, I don't know. It's like she didn't really go through a major story arc. She just went through these kind of adventures and did yeah. her thing. And by the end, she had to make a choice. Right. And then she made the choice. And yeah. then, you know, the the White Queen said, you know, only you can decide if you're going to fight the Jabberwocky or not. Right. So, and she's, she finally comes to grips with her destiny and, and does it. Yeah. So. But did you feel like it was kind of just being forced on her that it wasn't there wasn't like I don't know that Luke Skywalker kind of I'm grabbing the lightsaber because I realized I have the power when Luke does that it's very satisfying because you really feel like he's growing at that point but here when she yeah, puts that, on when the she, uniform when she put on the uni- armor and, the, and grabbed the big sword and everything I didn't feel anything emotionally I was like well of course I just, it was so of course she's going to do it yeah you know it just it was so pre- you knew it was going to happen You so it wasn't and she didn't really fight it so much the entire movie that wasn't a big development when she did. Right. And it seemed like her biggest thing was like, oh, this is this is my dream. It seems like a dream. that Every ten minutes it's like, oh, I'm just having a dream anyways, so what does this matter? That seemed to be like her main struggle or, I don't know, character development. It right. Was, there really wasn't a lot of meat to her. And so I guess the question would be, if you're making this movie or if we're an audience that's thinking about seeing this, does that ha- does it matter anymore? Is it well? Like- I think I mean the reason we went to see this. I don't. It wasn't necessarily to see a story arc. Necessarily to see someone's journey into womanhood. Right. It was to see Wonderland yeah. in big Technicolor in your face, and that's why if you're gonna see it, see an IMAX 3D. Yes, it's yes. not worth it otherwise. Right. It just it. It was right there in your face, and all the crazy colors, and all the crazy the toadstools, and yeah. this, that, and the other thing, and the cloud. It just. It was a candy. It was a visual candy land. It was it was Tim Burton. It was Tim Pandora. Burton's, Yeah, and and to that extent, the movie worked. That if that for that extent of it, the movie succeeded. I think wonderfully. So we could say that if you want to see this on IMAX in 3D, just because you want to enter some cr- imaginative yes. world, and probably you should get high beforehand. That would <laughs> probably help. I don't endorse this. I I will not. <laughs> I endorse it. <laughs> Get some endo. Get some, get some blaze endo. up. And, well, there is a blazing up. Uh, what is it? A the caterpillar. The, caterpillar, the, the caterpillar. smoking caterpillar. The exactly. Smoking caterpillar. So An excellent it's Alan in the movie. Rickman, by the way. So uh, yeah, Alan Rickman uh, <laughs> in fine Hans form. Gruber, in fine form. 
toking up, and that's the whole other Lewis Lewis Carroll, right? Yes, He's the original author. Yeah. Of this. What do you know? What year the the original? Alice it was, was he wrote in Victorian England. It was it was in that era. So, so kind of mid eighteen hundreds. Yeah, I mean there was definitely opium dens and okay. such going on. Yeah, but uh, the uh, I think he would not have referenced the psychedelic mushrooms or the right. And the right. whole books have been written about that. So the yeah. eat me and drink me and the. You know, the other Jefferson airplane song. Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, Alice in Wonderland, it's so, it almost kind of seemed, and when I was watching it, I was thinking, okay, she's going into the rabbit hole. So, it's being made now, live, for the first time, really live action. I don't know if there was a live action. There was a 1980s TV miniseries okay. with, like, Roddy Dow. Look it up on IMDb. Well, it dude, looks who like, needs yeah. IMDb when we got Jonas? Yeah. <laughs> Nicely done. But, like, so it's the first time it's live action, mm-hmm. and it's almost a little bit too late, because we have similar movies that have this idea that, basically, Alice in Wonderland, the book, probably was one of the first to come up with, where you're entering this fantasy land where you don't know if it's reality, if you're hallucinating, or if it is this kind of magical place. Right. So... Like The Matrix, for instance. Matrix was, references this nonstop. Yeah. You've got Chronicles of Narnia, where instead of the rabbit hole, you're going into the closet. Right. And you're entering a new world. Um, I had a bunch when I was watching this. I'm like, I can't think of them right now. Well, the never-ending story. Never-ending story. Like, another oh, yeah, great one. Exactly. This, where you're entering this fantasy land, and yeah. you think, it's, is it real, is it not? And yeah. So, when you're looking at those movies, let's say Never-Ending Story and Chronicles of Narnia, are they doing it better than Alice did it here? Did they create the world a little more deeply or what's what's the trick what it's you know we as the audience now we've seen all those movies and we're coming into alice right besides maybe maybe it's just we're jaded yeah i don't know maybe it's because i feel like i've just i've seen it done so many times that it really has to be something new like the matrix right was something completely out there yeah. to grab my attention because the matrix was a modernization of alice in right the it was complete and it was something i had not seen before yeah like this even with all the crazy visuals I guess I'm just spoiled with eye candy. Yeah. That's the problem with movies nowadays is that there's so much eye candy that it's it, it you're inundated to it. It, yeah. I, it takes so much to, like Avatar. Yeah. Avatar left me breathless. Avatar was like nothing I ever seen before. It was just blew my mind, new visual experience and but and so nothing everything's got to measure up to that now. Right. Now I will say this parenthetically Avatar Horrible movie. <laughs> Beautiful to look at. Horrible, horrible film. Dance with Wolves note for note. Just completely predictable. Bad dialogue. Bad acting. Can't say enough bad things about it. But I digress. <laughs> You've been waiting to get that out. You've yes. Been waiting. I effing has, thank God, Hurt Locker destroyed it. God bless. You, good for Catherine Bigelow. You, you wanted a forum so that that can be heard. I apologize. I'm done. I'll get my soapbox okay, now. Okay. Well, it's, that's kind of the struggle that we're entering in, in terms of just uh, an audience, where now... Where you're paying twenty dollars to see a movie on IMAX, right? In three D, so now this challenge or the question is going to become: Am I just looking for movies that just create the most luscious environments to experience, and am I willing to just put aside? Okay, I don't really care about story and character. Exactly, that and that's that the much. thing is that we're getting to a point now where luscious movie environments are going to be a dime a dozen. Yeah, and. I think what we're looking for is a mo- is movies that marry that incredible visual, forward thinking sensibility with a good script. With that, like like we just discussed, like Lord of the Rings was. Yes, like absolutely. the Fellowship of the, the all the three movies were a combination of creating that entire new realm that you've never been in before mm-hmm. with a great story and great yes. dialogue and great characters you cared about. And how awesome would that have been if we could see it in 3D? Absolutely. Peter Jackson, if you're listening, which I'm sure you are. Re-release, Peter. Re-release in 3D. If George Lucas can do it and ruin his films, you can do it and make yours better. Please do it, yeah. If Cameron's doing Titanic, re-release 3D. Uh. uh, (laughs) Give us Lord of the Rings. Give us Lord of the Rings, please. Absolutely. You know, the character that I kind of felt the most with was the dog. (laughs) <laughs> the dog, what was he fighting for? What was the the dog freedom for? of his family. The his freedom of his family. family. Exactly. And that's what happens when you give characters something to want that's personal and emotional. You really connect with them. And it was like him and even the, the floating, disappearing cat Trash wanted the cat. hat. Right. <laughs> you know, he at least had some kind of objective. But like the queen, what did you think about the queen in this movie? Well, the, I like... The, What's her name? The Red, the Red Queen, Queen. The Red Helen Bottom Carter. Yeah. Uh, I like the way they played her up. She's kind of basically like a, like a movie star diva. Yeah. Almost. She's kind of like, just like J-Lo. I imagine J-Lo would be like. Right. Just kind of like, you know, 
Come on, yeah. give, give me a bottle of water now. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah. No, like, yeah you know, kind of the most bratty movie pop star you can imagine. Yes, kind of thing. you know, I kind of think that's how they played her, and I like it. I think it definitely worked. Yeah, and she uh, looked great. Yes, you did. The visual again, visuals were phenomenal. Amazingly, uh, I didn't get the White Queen. I didn't get that whole arc in the storyline because if I thought the White Queen was banished. Yeah. But clearly she had her own kingdom. Exactly. That everyone was free to visit. <laughs> right. So why don't they just live with her? Yeah. Why are they subjected to the Red Queen? Exactly. I, okay. That made no sense to me. 100%. It, totally exactly right. Where there's no built-in conflict or tension there. Because it's like, okay, the uh, Red Queen took over. But the White Queen is fine. She's, she's yeah, She's got her castle. She's got her followers. Yeah. She's got all her people, her court and everything. Yeah, she's and got her digitized chess people walking around. Yeah, which was cool. And, <laughs> which is very, and even the Red Queen's the, card people. Oh, the card cool. people were excellent. Yeah, that was, they looked I, really cool. Yeah, I know. I did not know how he was going to do that yeah. and have it be incredibly cheesy. Yeah. And he, it looked great. It totally looked amazing. Yeah. But the, just there's no inherent work on the story at that level. Because obviously they're diverging from the source material where this is Alice Older. Right. So why not do some more work? And okay. Well, how about have the Red Queen have the White Queen imprisoned? Or right, just as an example. Her. Yes, yeah, the most just, basic thing. Just ever. To throw something out there. Yeah, there's no tension at all within that within that dynamic at all. So you're just in there like, okay, why why do I care? Okay, okay, get the Vorpal sword. I'm just laughing <laughs> like, Vorpal because when I was like 17, I had this friend we used to play. We didn't play Dungeons and Dragons. We played uh-huh. Gerp, Gerps, <laughs> and I haven't heard of it since. It was kind of like the poor man's Dungeons and Dragons, or I think it was like Steve Jackson games. And okay. They would kind of come up with they had like, you know, um, zombie thing, and you can do outer space thing. Right. And it was just basically Dungeons and Dragons, and it was like, okay, you have, you've got the Vorpal sword, you know, roll die and all this stuff, and just hearing that in the movie. Right. Got my like plus two like, against yeah. elf damage, sure, yeah. so, etc. So it was like, okay, get the Vorpal sword, bring it to her. And, it's and just then like, what she if, gives it back to Alice. Yeah. And yeah, there's no tension there. And I didn't under yeah, I didn't understand what that was about. There's a lot of things that just didn't make sense to me, mm-hmm. and not in a good like yeah. I'm pondering it, and it was Wonderland, and what so many questions. Like no, David just, Lynchian kind yeah, of yeah, no, just plot holes. Yeah, just plot, like, a lot of plot holes. Like I didn't get why all of a sudden the what was the big cat beast tiger thing? Yeah, the, with that got his eye poked out. Yeah, okay. when just she gave him back the eye. He was totally nice to her. Like, he tried to kill her before. Yeah. And he gets his eye back, and it's really just like, revenge. I mean, like, yeah. I'm going to slaughter you now. It's like, all of a sudden, he's, like, in her lap. And it, that made no sense. And just, he licks her, and okay, yeah, you know, on the wound. arm, on the arm. Yeah. And, yeah, okay, now I'm going to help you, and I'm Yeah, help now he's a good guy. guy. Yeah. And it would have been nice if there would have been something like, okay, uh, the Red Queen's got my family, just like the dog. Right. You know, she's holding everybody's families, or some kind of motivation. Right. Where when it busts out of the uh, little cabin that is trapped in to rescue her, because that kind of felt like a cheat a little bit, where she's got the sword and, like, all the card warriors are around her. Right, and then the big... And then the, whatever you... The big pol- cat, polar bear pol- cat yeah, pol- guy. Yeah, <laughs> just bursts out. out. Well, it was very much, again, like Avatar, when the whole... Forrest comes rushing to defend. Yeah. It's that same kind of thing. So that was got... a little bit set up, though, where, like, he went in Avatar to kind of, like, pray. Even yeah, though I, they yeah. kind of... It, it see, the thing... My whole thing with... Uh, what's the actor that played uh, the main character? I don't even know. I don't... Oh, he's in uh, Clash of the Titans and Terminator Salvation. Okay. Um, it's probably a sign of his acting, because I can't remember. Yeah. But he... In that movie, like, his character really kind of didn't have that growth, you know? And so you kind of... You bought him going to pray and, like, okay, you know... Planet uh, Pandora, right, Gaia, please, you know, Gaia, Gaia, the Earth Mother, please help us, kind of thing like yeah. that. So, what I'm saying, it was just kind of this, like, okay, here comes the cavalry. Yeah, idea. The cavalry comes in exactly, right. but it was it was unearned, I think. Yeah, and you, you definitely want if someone's going to turn against someone that has control over them or they're loyal to someone, there's got to be a big reason for yeah. it. And there was no, I did not understand any reason behind it. Yeah, and I think a lot of it too, like because. With the Red Queen, you know, aside from the awesome visuals, and she had some quirky, cool character stuff to her, what was her overall motivation? Like, what does she, you know, what does she want? What does she want control of? Like, what are some other characters in other films that are kingly or emperorly, and they, you know, what are their objectives, you know? And right. Was there something here that could be given to her as a character to have so that would be like, this is why I'm doing what I'm doing. The only thing, I mean, they did kind of reference it when they, her and the White Queen, her sister, met in battle. It was kind of like this, the, our parents always liked you best kind of a thing. Yeah. So she was, the White Queen was always the favorite one, so this is kind of her just eternal revenge. It's, yeah, it's, but it's more like a ri- sibling rivalry kind of thing. Yeah. And it almost seemed like that was too small for us to care that, like, a kingdom wouldn't people, I mean, i got to give this movie credit for that up. 
pit, that pit of heads that yeah, Alice that, had to jump okay, over. That, I will say this. That was the one time in the movie where I'm like, that is dark and that is really cool. Yeah. Yeah, she has to go across this moat of heads because you know the breaking off of their off of their head that's like she says like a million she says like 50 times in the movie right, off yes. with her head which and when Alice said that at the end was so cheeseball yeah. and just made me cringe yeah. and when Alice slays the big Jabberwocky she cuts his head off and goes off with your head uh, yeah. and it was just the shot of her floating though was kind of cool the shot was cool it but looked then, cool yeah. and then and then it came down and it's like ah cheeseball and there was no and that was another relationship where when she defeats the Jabberwocky the Jabberwocky earlier says like, "Oh, our my ancient enemy is back," and blah blah. The Vorpal blah. Sword. Yeah, the Vorpal Sword. But it would have been nice if there would have been more of like an Alice kind of and the Jabberwocky relationship kind of thing going on because you really didn't feel like. Well, he even says to her, "You're insignificant. Yeah, I don't care about you. It's the sword." But you know what? But it, that was kind of like everyone telling her in Victorian England that she's insignificant. That's right. That's right. And because there was the moment with the White Queen saying. Just hold on to the sword. It'll know what to do. Right. Were you, and I was kind of expecting it to... I'm trying to think of the Disney movie where, like, there the was singing some... So, the singing, singing sword. sword yeah. yeah, where it kind of almost took on its own life. Right, and it but didn't I, do that. Alice was yeah. just doing the thing. But so. I guess it would have depowered her, you know? Mm-hmm. You want her to be the one. But that's another thing. I was kind of expecting... Or I don't know if this is a structure in the original story that everyone that's in the reality... Has the new persona? No, it's the, not like it's not like Wizard of Oz in that sense. Wizard of Oz. Yeah, I mean yeah. there is whatever the uh, would-be father-in-law is the caterpillar guy and the two sister girls. Uh, are Twiddly the, told twi- dumb. Yeah. Right. But other than that, there's right. And the Red Queen, I guess, would be the mother-in-law. Because they kind of start establishing these characters. Okay, and uh, who would her fiance be? Yeah, and then who would her sister be? Who's yeah. the rabbit? Who's yeah. the Mad Hatter? Yeah. Who's the hare? So they kind of do it half-assedly. Right. They don't really follow through all the way. Yeah. And now I guess if you're Lewis Carroll and. You've been doing the opium or whatever is influencing your imagination for the right. first story. Maybe you're not going to be so linear in terms of your logic of like, okay, this character has to represent this character. Well, that, I, that's the thing, though, is that the amazing thing about the original Alice, looking through the glass, the original Lewis Carroll stories, is how it's nonlinear and it's all based on circular logic uh-huh. and kind of nonsense. Yeah. And there wasn't that much of that in this film. I thought. Yeah. I thought the film stand a very standard progressive story arc of kind of the hero's journey and, you know, get the sword, slay the beast, and you're, you are the chosen one, you are Neo, yeah, you know? Exactly, exactly. <laughs> and it wasn't enough random just silliness. Yeah. You know, even the Mad Hatter, who we, we need to talk about, even his randomness was kind of just, uh, it was ancillary. Yeah, you know? well, let's get to it. Johnny Depp, okay. Mad Hatter. Yeah. Everywhere, everywhere I saw it, all the movie promotions, Johnny Depp, Mad Hatter, Johnny Depp, he's on the cover yeah. of all the magazines, he's on the billboards, and I did not like his character. I did not, I like Johnny Depp, I love that he, he will do these crazy roles that like a really handsome, he could be a really like movie star, movie star, yeah. and he doesn't, he chooses weird character roles. Right. And I gave him mad props for that. But this character, why, what was with the Scottish accent? They kind of dipped in and out of was like a William Wallace type thing. Yeah, like that's that right. was random and we. And then what was with? I just he was wistful and I didn't. I had no again. I had no investment in him as a character. He would just seem like this random thing again. I guess I was complaining for not being random enough, but right. that just why was he such a central figure? Okay, he was like one of the main characters. Yeah, and he didn't need to be. Yeah, and. Because I don't remember the original story, what happens at the end. I mean, Alice just goes... I think she just, she just exits Wonderland. She just ex- she just has, like, a good yeah. old kind of trippy time. Yeah, it's basically, just, yeah, yeah. Okay, so she, just, so she doesn't really solve any problems or anything? I don't think so, no. Because I think, uh, just to compare it to Narnia, where they did the second one, I think when they left, it was everything was fine. Then they, then they come back however many years later, and everything's gone to hell, right? right. Like, since you've left, you know, things <laughs> have gone kind of bad. So there's not any of that here. So the Mad Hatter wouldn't have had any kind of character growth or change. Well, he even said he was waiting at the tea party. Okay. He had been there. Him and the March Hare had been waiting there for the past ten years. Yeah. And, again, it comes back to this idea of, like, well, he's, he kind of rises up this revolution against the Red Queen. There's that big scene where it's kind of, it's like a William, almost like a William Wallace Braveheart scene. Yeah. Where he's got the giant broadsword yeah, and everything. Yeah. That was kind that of was weird. That was weird. The Mad Hatter is like a broadsword. <laughs> Which made, and again, why did they just go live with the White Queen? It's just, it's, it's, I just don't understand. <laughs> it's a, don't, why are we even fighting? Why are we even fighting? She's got a, I mean, she's got like the Palace of Versailles. You know, right. She's got the hugest 
real estate property in Wonderland. Yeah. And they could all just go. And I guess for the Red Queen, the people are being held because of the uh, Jabberwocky. Yeah. That for some reason is making everyone scared to right, follow the her, Red Queen. Right, in her court, yeah. And it's but. just because why? She'll just say... She'll stick the Jabberwocky on Okay, and there's, and there's no nothing explained on why the Jabberwocky... Is loyal to her. Loyal to her. Or, right. Is it the crown? So does that mean it was loyal to the White Queen before? If she had the crown on? Yeah. So it's just that kind of stuff. And for me, if you're going to just make up a whole new kind of mature Alice kind of thing, do the work. And right. really <laughs> think everything through. And it's just like... Did they just get so caught up in, okay, this is going to be 3D, it's going to be IMAX, it's going to look great, it's going to have Tim Burton's thing to it, that's going to be enough for people to check out. I think that's what they, I think that's what they did. I think, and I don't understand why there's, there's got, is there just not enough good writers out there? I, I can't imagine that's the case. I know a lot of great writers that are yeah. like, they're, they're struggling to get things published. I just, but apparently, everyone else, the people that are actually have the jobs are just kind of churning things out. Like... The I we looked it up. The woman that did the screenplay did Mulan yeah. and did Lion King, which some great which Lion great. King Lion King was great, Lion was great, you know. And so I understand why here it wasn't there wasn't much meat to the story. Yeah, yeah. And for me, I you know I'm always going to be the proponent of story s- first and story, script first, yeah, dialogue and characters, especially character because it's right. like if you're it, it's just almost built in that if you're going to have this girl who's in this repressed Victorian kind of society. Who basically runs away from the moment... Okay, so she gets asked to get married. Right. And she's like, I need a minute. And she starts following this rabbit. So it's almost like you could say that she has this defense mechanism kind of thing going of like, I'm just going to escape from this reality because it's too much. It's too hard to it's handle. It's too hard to do it. And I'm going to follow this rabbit and who knows if this is a reality or not, but I'm going to do it anyways. But if she's going to go into that rabbit hole... She's got to go through some kind... You know, it's like Luke going into the... It's the hero's journey. Her, it's, it's, it's exactly it's transformative, the hero's journey. Right. And it should be... Not so... I guess I don't want to make it so, like, obvious where, okay, step one is she overcomes the willing the, the power of the mother over her. And right. Just, yeah. Now she encounters a character that's like the fiancé, and she learns to say no, because they do almost have, like, this... Unverified, unjustified resolution at the end. Right, where she, she comes tells, out... And she comes out and tells yeah. everybody off. Yeah. And it's their... Yeah, there, it is un, it's not justified by, by her character development. Yeah. It's just like, okay, I'm going to come out. And she literally, every character who was bothering her, right. she says, here's what I think of you. Right. But there's nothing that creates that, that the only, newfound... It's, beca- it's, it be- it's because she decided she was to seize her destiny and fight the Jabberwocky. Yeah. But we don't get why she did that. Yeah. Other and, than she was... Her whole thing is like... Her whole thing is like she resents being told what to do. Mm-hmm. Like she resents... Uh, being told to marry this guy, she even says, and when she f- enters Wonderland or Underworld, as it's called, yeah. uh, I you know she resents them telling her what to do. She's like, "I'm not this Alice. It's not destiny." And then the resolution is, is that it is her destiny, and she does. I guess because she chooses it. Yeah. I guess that's the point: is that she does choose it, and so it does give her the power of choice. Yeah, it's, it's inside of her from the beginning, where she has right. this cur- curiosity and kind of. She's not necessarily built for this environment that she's in. She's right. she's made to explore, and with the end of her going on the boat, that whole kind of thing yeah. is there. But it's just not explored enough. And uh, that character, the uh, caterpillar, the hookah smoking caterpillar, yeah. almost kind of seems like a uh, Yoda. You know, kind yes, of, it totally. could, could have been a Yoda character. Yeah, you know, oh, I do like though the caterpillar basically just insults her the yeah. entire movie. Yeah, I would have liked to have seen the caterpillar because he's he's the one who's like, oh, you're not totally Alice, right? And he's almost got that wisdom mo- kind of character. Right, you know, at the that, end, he's like, you're Alice. The and, sage. So it would have been mm-hmm. nice if he would have been maybe guiding her a little bit more and taking her through those steps. Because right. he has that cool visual metaphor where he is, he's going to be transformed. Right, yeah. He goes through the... He becomes a butterfly. Butterfly. At the end. He's yeah. being cocooned as he's doing his final speech. Right, so... And then in th- I, I do like the last shot when the butterfly lands on her. And she... I forgot the the caterpillar's name. Right, but... But she says, oh, you know... Absalom. Hello, hello uh, hookah smoking Absalom. Absalom. I Absalom. Think? Seems like a like a Battlestar Galactica yeah, kind trying, of. Yeah. I am Absalom, but it's, it sounds something like that. I'm I'm bad with remembering movies <laughs> after I watch a movie. But that would have been a great little. That's a super awesome payoff for a relationship that he's transformed, and so has she. Right. You know, it's almost like Clarence gets his wings from uh, what's the famous. Jimmy uh, Stewart movie. Yeah. It's a Wonderful Life. It's a Wonderful Life. Yeah, yeah. it's almost... Because even Clarence is like, I'm doing this because I need to get my wings, right? So every character, you know, for me, every character should have some kind of motivation. And every time you see them, 
they're all taking a step towards whatever they want, even if you only see them five times in the movie. Right. You know, the more motivated they are, the better, instead of just like, oh, Alice is coming into my scene. Okay, let me get up from my chair, and i got to start doing wacky stuff and being whoever. Which is what the Mad Hatter felt like. The Mad Hatter was just, like, wacky just to be... Uh, just to be wacky, and but he wasn't wacky. He wasn't entertainingly wacky. Entertainingly, he wasn't. I wasn't entertained by the Mad Hatter. Yeah. I, I didn't. I didn't enjoy him. I didn't think he was funny. I didn't yeah. like. You think the Mad Hatter should be cut? What I will give them credit for is they resisted, mostly resisted the urge to reference any kind of pop culture. Which is like a cancer in children's films, <laughs> yes, with this yes. kind of like the penultimate Maya favorite reference is like "Raise the Reef," which is from Shark Tales. Okay, you know this kind of like "Raise the Reef." Raise, oh, you know, yeah. It was just like this need to, or like "Cat in the Hat" was the worst, where it's just all uh, really uh, inappropriate, and, like <laughs> dick jokes, and okay, like okay. so <laughs> they were they. Almost totally resisted that. Yeah. But they ruined that. And two, there's two parts. One where the Mad Hatter's talking about M-words and refers to point blankly calls the queen a moron, which okay. was silly and stupid. And, like, they wouldn't use the term moron in Victorian England. It was just completely out of time. And it really jarred me out of the, mo- the movie world. And at the end, with the dance. The dance. At the end, he, the Mad Hatter does that they're alluding to it the entire time. As he'll do this farful dance and... <laughs> Farful Nugent or Farful Nugent. Butter Walking. Yeah, exactly. and I thought they were dropping that bomb at the first. Yeah, like, well, even the, the, you made some weird like sexual connotation with it. Like okay. he said, he said like he gets a leer in his voice, and he's like, <laughs> "Oh, I used to do it intently," or something really <laughs> kind of creepy. Yeah, yeah, that's right, that's right. That's but funny. so at the end, he does this dance, and all of a sudden, this this pop music starts playing, like yeah. like break dance, like music, like bad it, like breaking boogaloo. Tunes yes, it was it break it, like electric tune boogaloo. Yeah. Yes, it was like it was like that, and it had no place in the movie. It was completely random, completely out of left field, and really jarred me out of the reality he had worked yeah. so hard to create. Yeah, and I don't know why they felt the need to do that. Yeah, it could have. I mean, they are alluding to and setting it up the whole time, so. At least just create and make it make sense within the reality. It's right. His Lord of the Dance crazy version, but maybe some kind of weird, the plants are making the music or something right. that's connected to it and doesn't take you out and you're like, oh, okay, this is even this And the is dance, funny. too, was like a kind of a very modern, like, booty shaking, yeah. like, yeah, like yeah. fly girls almost. Yeah, <laughs> like. and it was kind of like, okay... And then it didn't have, like, a big payoff for him either. Yeah, he just kind of... He's just like, okay... He, he dances and it's over. I'm and the it's, court, <laughs> court jester, I guess, or something. Yeah, what does he become? He beca- yeah. yeah, he just he stays the same. He's There was this thing where he kind of seemed to like Alice. So, like, he had a crush on her. Out of, towards the end, he's like, you could stay. Yeah. So it was almost like he's With kinda, this weird kind of romantic tension between them that was, yeah, yeah kind of creepy. Maybe that could have... But that would have been weird because that means he would have had a crush on her the first time When he was, he was there, a nine-year-old, like, yeah. That had her just got pervy, you know? He, <laughs> that changes the whole dynamic yeah. of the character. We don't want to go there. One thing about Crispin Glover is Chris- in it. How and, can we forget Crispin and, Glover? Well, because he didn't do anything Crispin Gloverish. Another character he was that wasted. was wasted. He was he wasted. Was wasted. It's just you. You see Crispin Glover, you're like, oh, this is gonna be awesome. Yeah. He's gonna be just weird and off the wall. No, he played it very straight. Yeah, there was nothing memorable about his character. Yeah, the, whatsoever. He, absolutely. Like at, when I saw him on the screen, I'm like, okay, that's either Crispin Glover. Or like just some no name actor, the that, guy who was like the bad karate teacher in part Karate Kid Part Three, who was like you know <laughs> making Larusso go through all the you're gonna have pain, like with the ponytail, yes. like him years later with like the scar on his face. He was like a a weird snake Pliskin or something, right? Uh, and as like Crispin Glover, I mean you gotta have him do his Christopher Walkeny kind of like I'm high and I'm weird kind of, and he let him do that, let him know? do that, and he just was in a straight jacket, and just it's like why bother? Why even yeah. have him? Why? Uh, yeah, so I thought Crispin was wasted in that. Yeah, and which it, kind of disappointed me. Just getting another thing of like you know, for me, I I would just wish every screenplay was approached like Lost. Now I don't, you haven't seen Lost, not yet. Right? Don't you're, you're holding off. Give I'm me no spoilers. It. Okay, but I mean you've heard the. You, you, I know the gist of it, and it's I very know... character focused. Yes, where you've heard about flashbacks, right? Yes. Okay, so we're basically in Lost. Every character where they have the episodes where here's what's going on, and then we get flashbacks of who this person is. And do that work on a screenplay. You know, the Crispin Glover character here should have had some kind of background, and you just get that he came in on his horse, and he brings fire and brimstone and a sword, and he just, you he's know... He's just a bad guy. And he's, he's just, just a bad guy. He's just a bad guy. And there's nothing different or interesting about this guy. And yeah, he's completely two-dimensional. And in, in, in an Alice in Wonderland movie, you're expecting every character to be weird and different and something new that you've never and seen. And he was... Compl- and Crispin Glover, the weirdest... 
differentest dude on the planet yeah. was completely forgettable. Now that might now is that kind of his way of doing? Is he like maybe doing that's Crispin's? Maybe that's Crispin's personal motivation. Yeah. I can't speak to that. But. <laughs> Crispin's like, oh, I'm going to show them. I'm going to play the most straightforward, straight yeah, bad guy. Ever. Yeah, you, you don't think that I could do this, but I'm going to pull it off. Right. And, if that was his intention, he did. He yeah, succeeded. You know? Succeeded. When I'm in the theater with a lot of people, and I don't go to the theater that often um, on like Friday nights and stuff, so it was, right. it was cool on like, Tuesday to see so many people. I guess right. it's IMAX. So yeah. That's what's going to happen. Um, pack theater. Did you expect to see have more laughter and more reactions from the audience? There, that's the thing. There wasn't any emotional reaction from the audience. I, there was no laughter, and there, there were a couple. I mean. There were a couple weird attempts at humor that didn't really stick, and yeah. there was no gasps, no, oh my gods, no, like, no, <gasps> yeah. you know, like, there was none of that. It was just people passively watching the film, Yeah, and I think that speaks to it, that it wasn't engaging at all. Yeah. It was just, it was eye candy. It was just pretty things on a screen. Right. I mean, laughter, clapping, anything that gets people right. reacting, you know you're doing something right. Right. And especially for this, you don't get a lot of movies where a female is the main character, especially mm-hmm. a young woman right. who hasn't graduated from, like, Slut Academy or something. Yeah. Now. And here she's just kind of trying to find her way. You don't get a lot of those stories. And, I don't know, maybe I'm I'm just too, you know, old-fashioned or something, but I would have loved to have seen her kind of just go through something. And so when she comes out and tells everyone off, you kind of feel like... It's earned. You go, girl, or something. Right, like, exactly. It's earned and... It, yeah, it was under So, uh, getting back to a quick, just streamline, I would say th- it's a weird problem because the only reason to see it is IMAX 3D, yeah. but those those tickets are expensive. I don't know if I can justify spending that much money on a movie I essentially didn't like. Yeah. Like, I'm never going to see it again. Right. The sp- TV, rental. Oh, no, no, don't. Don't bother. Yeah. Don't bother. So, you have this, this weird... Problem of yeah, the only reason to see it is go see it like big bold. So again, that's why I recommend it stoners and little kids. Yeah, yeah. So if you want to get lost in in the environment, it does have that Avatar kind of luscious kind of feel. Even though here it does kind of do the gimmicky stuff a little bit. Where, like, yeah, things at flying you. at you. <laughs> it's like, like here's here the comes spear. and the guy's hand is right in your face. <laughs> yeah, especially when she falls down the rabbit hole at the beginning. Yeah, things are like, just flying at you. Uh, you know, it's yeah. like okay, and at least in Avatar, it was like let's just bring you into the world kind of right. Thing. But, yeah, I'm going to agree that, you know, the only reason to see this in the theater is to see it 3D minimum, and I would recommend IMAX, but then I kind of, I don't know if I'd recommend $20. Like, exactly. Yeah, I can't justify, so like, I would say, like, a matinee, yeah. like, I, it, but you can't get a matinee Is there a IMAX. matinee IMAX? There no, is not. not. It's a $20 ticket. So, a matinee 3D regular screen, would that be... Even, yeah, I guess a matinee, even it, uh, yeah, even then, though, I just, again, I'm getting jaded to eye candy. Yeah. I just, it's a dime a dozen these days, it feels like. It really has to be something revolutionary to be worth it to it's me. It's so sad, because, I mean, if if this movie was just by itself, came out ten years ago, it would oh, be like... Oh, it would be like, not, yeah. unbelievable. Yeah. And you know, there's so, so many hours went into this, so many talented people made this a reality, and it's flawless. I mean, right. you never it's, sit there and you're like... I don't believe that. I mean, it looks Yeah, amazing. the world you believe. You yeah. believe the world. You just don't believe the characters. Yeah, the texture, everything is great. But it, you know, it's just like anything where the environment ultimately doesn't matter. It's like what the, it's the people that are in that environment that we care about. That's exactly. So. Yeah, and it's just like, you know, it's just American Idol every season or Survivor. It's the same situation, but with the confession cam moments where you get to know the people... That's why you keep watching, because it's different people, different reactions, their unique kind of perspective. They're all on their own journeys, and that's why we keep tuning in, because we want to see, okay, this person should win it, or I hate her, you know, she's mm. a good bad guy, so I'm, I'm against her. But here, it's, it's, it's not working out. So, maybe let's just close with, you know, you're a huge movie fan, you have a great... Um, encyclopedic knowledge of a film. <laughs> wasted youth. Wasted youth. Wasted I'll, I'll, youth. Uh, I'm along with that. But I don't I don't look at it as wasted. <laughs> Someone told me a quote like Albert Einstein said that if you want your kids to be smart, uh, tell them stories. And if you want them to be very smart, tell them a lot of stories. Mm, I like that. So, I mean, storytelling is kind of the most prevalent, I don't know, it's one of the most prevalent aspects of our society. So, you as a movie fan... What are your thoughts? You know, you just got back from this. You paid a lot of money. Um, it's only viewable on IMAX. It's not even worthy watching at home, I mean, just renting it. What are your just thoughts in general about 
how I don't know you feel about what's going on with the movies lately, and yeah, again, that's just my that's my main critique is that is, is Avatar syndrome, which is it's just big, bold, splashy effects and in your face, and there's nothing behind it. Yeah, and again, that would be it'd be one thing if it came out. 20 years ago when no one had seen anything like that but where every other movie is stuff you've never seen before it's kind of like that idea yeah. and it's getting you know the, the very samey I'm getting really jaded to it and I not to go back to Avatar bashing but if it had a good script if it had believable characters good acting then yes of course it should have been best picture of course it should have but it had none of that so good I'm glad it's, God bless the Hurt Locker right you know right. Um, I'm not glad I saw it yeah. I don't feel I, I feel like I never, I never seen it I wouldn't have missed anything my life would be no poorer for it mm-hmm. like and that's a sad thing to say about a how much millions of dollars went into this movie yeah you know this was a lot of money went into this movie a lot of talent Johnny Depp who usually is wonderful Tim Burton who did a fine job here you know but Oh, and, and the always reliable Danny Elfman. <laughs> Danny Elfman. They, they kind of come as a package deal. That's like, true. Those Bert three. and Depp and Elfman all kind of That's come together. Like the studio's like, if I get those three, I'm greenlighting them. Yeah, project. exactly. And, again, like we go back to, I think, the ultimate movie that succeeded in these effects was the first Matrix and the Lord of the Rings trilogy. Right. Those really succeeded in creating a world with people you cared about. Yeah. And with a story that you that engaged you. Right. So, yeah, again, I, yeah, if I had never seen this... I'd be fine. Yeah. In fact, I'd probably turn... i have $20 more than, than I have now. And do you find yourself going to the movies less and less and just being more content to just, okay, I'll just rent it when I it Netflix, out. yeah. I Netflix, Netflix everything is. these days. I just... It has to be... Because to spend that kind of money, I've always said, if they cut movie prices in half, I go five times as much. Right. You know, they would have all my... I would go see everything in the theater. Yeah. Uh, but the only... I, it has to be really something special to get me to go out to a movie theater yeah. these days. Something like, I can't I can't wait to see, like, the new Tarantino movie, or, like, you know, Young Glorious Bastards, what, you know, something that, like, of an auteur, or Scorsese, or someone that, right. like, I need to see this right away. I can't wait for this. Or a big special effects bonanza that just won't be the same on a small screen. Sure. But for the most part, the movies I tend to like... I can, yeah, I'll wait till they come out on DVD. They don't necessarily need that big screen. Yeah, to tell the story. Yeah, yeah. And it seems that that's kind of the era that we're entering in, where it's no no longer, is, you know, the Sundance of the 90s, that whole effect, whether you had all those filmmakers like Tarantino, Rodriguez, Smith, uh, Richard Lankletter, mm-hmm. kind of, you know, breaking through the stories that they're telling now, because we have cable and Netflix and just so many avenues to watch movies... They're not big enough for the big screen anymore. So right. it almost seems that you need well, these huge properties. The other, and the, the other thing is that TV has gotten so good. That's true. And that's a complete, obviously, that's a complete small screen medium. And that's, there's so much good TV out there that movies, I think, are, are really face a stiff competition from that. They talk about the internet, they talk about outside, you know. But really, I mean, shows like just, you know, comic, like 30 Rock or The Office, but then Lost. Battlestar Galactica, you know, Mad Men, The Sopranos, The Wire, all these wonderful shows that, you know, you can watch on DVD and, you know, and be no At your convenience, At your convenience, yeah. Absolutely. And it's just that there's only so many hours in the day, right? Right. And only so much money in the wallet. Yeah, and there's only so much money, especially nowadays. So now the goal is like, okay, we have to somehow filter and wade through all that and make the decisions of, okay... Which What's is why I'm glad there's your <laughs> website, <laughs> moviepreviewcritic.com, <laughs> which filters it for you and tells you where to spend your hard earned money and where not to. Oh, so. I'll pay you for that after I uh, press stop on this recording. <laughs> Thank you for that, by the way. No problem. Well, it's just that, you know, we're, we're all in the same boat, and we're just trying to figure out what's worth our time, what's worth our money, and there's just so much of it out there. It's being camouflaged so well, so flashily, it's being, you know, just marketed of like, oh, that looks pretty good. And then right. when you get there, you're leaving with this feeling of like, well, that was oh, a waste boy, of time. You know, someone just dropped some GHB in my drink, and I don't know what happened <laughs> for the last two hours. And I don't feel it was that the, bad. I have to go to the doctor and check I don't out if feel, I got the herp or something. I don't feel violated by <laughs> Alice in Wonderland. I'll say that much for it. <laughs> okay. Well, but I that, can't recommend that it. That might be a new rating. You yeah, will not, not, feel, vi- not, you will not feel violated. All right, well, just to note, this did make about $120 million opening weekend. Yeah. And I read that I think it shattered the box office for this time period. Mm-hmm. And that has a lot to do with the uh, IMAX ticket price. Oh, I mean, totally. We went to IMAX Tuesday, 7 o'clock. It was packed. It was full. It was, it was packed, full. Packed. And what were there, maybe 300, more 500 seats? I Something don't know. like that, but big. Oh, it's a really, <laughs> really big theater. And if you, I'm sure if you go to any 2D theater, 
you're not going to find a lot of people checking this out on a Tuesday. So the no. IMAX, and right now IMAX here in Chicago is seventeen dollars. Seventeen bucks. And you can a downtown theater is like ten fifty yeah. or something like that. So you're getting fifty percent more. So it's just like Avatar, where they're saying that it made the most, but in terms of um, audience attendance, it's half of what Titanic had or something. Oh, okay. So right. it's, the numbers can be deceiving, but expect I guess Clash of the Titans is the next big movie to come out. Well, that I'm looking forward to. It should be. It should be good. I'm I'm doing a preview review on it right now. I should have it out hopefully in the next week. It's looking once again uh, moviepreviewcritic.com. <laughs> <laughs> once again, Jonas gets another twenty dollars. <laughs> Listen to it uh, wrinkly, the shuffling, <laughs> wrinkling in my hand as I give it to him. There, we, there you go, Jonas. There's a nice 50 spot for you. <laughs> but it's, uh, yeah, that's, they, actually, that movie wasn't supposed to be 3D, but they kind of bumped it up to 3D after Avatar made all the money. Right. Looks, looks like one of those that it might just be really cool to look at, but the preview is not promoting the character. and that, It's just bothering me that... Well, yeah, but most previews, though... Are about the Flash. They do. They, they got to grab you. And they yeah, gotta... because lately I've been I've been like trying to compare to older movies, right? And we're like Braveheart or Gladiator. They do a lot of like you know. Here's kind of why I'm fighting for right. What I'm the story arc. That's true. Here's some yeah. here's some cool quotes for me. And now it's like this uh, Clash of Titans is like two lines, and then it's just like uh, Medusa <laughs> and scorpions <laughs> and Zeus and the, the release the Kraken. Release the Kraken. It's like, okay. Which we're all waiting for. <laughs> yeah, and that's, you know that's going to be the money shot of the movie, yeah. so we're kind of entering a scary You know, time. Anyway, I do caveat all this by saying I, I do like big special effects stupid, like, I don't know. It's, it's I like, agree. I'm told, I, do. I do like big, noisy, crazy, I want to see the Kraken. Yeah. I'll, I want to <laughs> I see, see the, the Kraken. Kraken. I do too, I do too, but hopefully, yeah. We'll oh, see. to that end, coming attraction for Tron 2, oh my god, yeah. I can't wait. Tron two, Tron <laughs> I'm, two I'm booking my tickets now. Yeah, yeah. The the one who kind of arguably started the whole CGI. CGI age, yeah. Hopefully now is going to kind of bring it to its. It uh, looks amazing. It, it does it looks. visually looks beyond amazing. Yeah. So let's hope it can uh, deliver also with that. So. Okay, so there you go. All right, Jonas. I get, I'm glad that we did this. This is the first time I've ever done this kind. Of, it's usually just me and a microphone. <laughs> so this is fun to have a little bit of a back and forth. What's well, my favorite thing is after a movie, just to like you know go to a coffee shop and grab a cup of coffee and slice of pie and just talk yeah. about the film. And so. I'm totally glad that you said that. You know, I love big movies as well. Just I can just imagine like the 13 year old version of me listening to this, be like, "Dude, you're such a nerd. Come <laughs> on, you, you shouldn't enjoy these kind of movies. It's what you really enjoyed when you were younger." But I'm I'm gonna argue that back in the late 80s and early 90s, I think the bigger budget movies. Had more heart and character to them than they do now. Right. Okay. All right. Thanks for keeping hey, it real, no, Jones. Thanks for having thanks for me. Hanging. I'm glad we did this. Yeah, and, me uh, too. Oh, let's do a quick plug. I want to. Jonas has been so kind to promote their movie preview critic. Jonas has just started a little website, and I'm really excited about it. Please talk about that for a little. Oh moment. yeah, it's a uh, it's a new blog I've started. It's from my book that I wrote that I've been trying to get published. Uh, it's called Zen and the Art of Waitering. It's at blogspot.com. It's just Zen and the Art of Waitering by Blogspot, uh, and it's. Basically, I've been a professional waiter for most of my adult life, and I got tired of complaining all the time. So we all have the same complaints over and over and over again. The the Waiter Rant website that's so popular is just an endless bitch fest. Right. And while that can be fun, we, I think we're all guilty of it. Anyone in the industry is guilty of it. And it's like, well, why do we keep banging our, you know, the, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. And we keep doing that. We keep bitching about campers and bad tips and people that come in right before close and it's just what's the solution right. it's either you know it's if you hate it that much then what are you doing yeah just quit yeah just quit but if you can't quit if you feel forced to be there well then is there a way to do that and be happy at your job and be at peace Absolutely. and so i, I address that in my blog i address that in my book and i think a very humorous way Damn. so wow. the, even if you're not a waiter check out the blog because i really think that it's I, I talk a lot about just I read a lot about Buddhism, about Eastern philosophy, and I think the reason it's been around for so many years is that it's applicable to anyone's day to day life. Absolutely. I think they're universal truths. Yeah, Zen is every moment, no matter the situation you're in. Exactly. So waitering is sometimes just another permutation of yeah, that. Yeah, when you're in that situation, it's just almost like the universe kind of okay. Here's a little test for you. You know, right. what are you going to learn about yeah. yourself? What are you going to learn about someone else? And 
Pray for patience, God puts you in a traffic jam. You know, <laughs> exactly. that's the old Zen. Zen and the Art of Waitering blogspot.com. Zen and the Art of Waitering <laughs> dot blogspot.com. I want to be very clear. Jonas, thank you very yeah, much. Yeah, thanks for having pleasure, me. Dude. We should do this again. All right. Long live good movies. Long live good movies.